optimized. I will say this about investing. Everything you do learn is cumulative. What I learned at 20 is useful. Equity. Welcome to another episode of Equity Mates, It's a podcast that follows our journey of investing. Whether you're an absolute beginner or approaching Warren Buffett status, our aim is to help break down your barriers from beginning to dividend. My name is Bryce, and as always, I am joined by my equity mate, Ren. How's it going? I'm very good, Bryce. Very excited for this week that we're halfway through, Crypto Week. Yes. Uh, the week your dreams are made of. Yeah, it's been a big week. <laughs> yeah, yeah. A uh, few, few uh, episodes to come to close out uh, Crypto Week, um, but this one I'm excited about, as you are, I'm I'm always I'm excited, sure. yeah. <laughs> Uh, because we're joined uh, by an expert and uh, we're going to be talking about what is going on in the crypto ecosystem, which is uh, something that I claim to know very little about. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think uh, so we've got uh, Blake who will introduce us in a second here today and then we've got Alex uh, on the show tomorrow and yep. I think um, after these two episodes, we're going to realize just how little we know about, about crypto. And then we won't talk about crypto <laughs> ever again. <laughs> but yeah, it is our pleasure to welcome, welcome Blake Cassidy, who is the CEO of Bamboo. Blake, welcome to the show. Guys, thanks so much for having me. Excited to be here. So Bamboo is uh, Australia's first crypto micro-investing app, allowing investors to invest in Bitcoin, Ethereum, gold, and silver. Uh, Blake took over as CEO in November 2020 and is working to scale up Bamboo in Australia and preparing to launch overseas. So a lot going on over at Bamboo, Blake. Yes, thank you very much. Yeah, it is, it's uh, been pretty crazy over the last year and uh, yeah, we're excited to, to grow the business and take things forward. If you missed our episode on Monday, head back and have a listen where we um, go into Bamboo in a little bit more detail and as and uh, explain why we like it. But um, yeah, we think it's a, a great app and here at Equity Mates, we're all about making markets accessible and we certainly feel like Bamboo is doing that um, for you know people looking to not only get into the crypto market, but uh, dollar cost average into things like gold and silver as well. So. Um, we have a we have a promo code. We do, we do. So uh, if you want to download Bamboo and use the code Equity Mates, uh, Bamboo, well, Blake personally will give you ten dollars <laughs> towards uh, the asset allocation of your choice. So you can split it across uh, Bitcoin, Ethereum, Gold, or Silver. Um, but yeah, look, we which uh, you know, there's a lot of noise in the crypto space, but we think Bamboo is a good one. You know. Dollar cost average in. Mm. Don't try and time the market because if you're trying to time the Bitcoin market, you probably lose a lot of sleep mm. and a lot of hair like me. Yes. Uh, um, so, yeah, we think Bamboo's a good one. If you want to dip your toe in the water, um, it's a good way to get started in crypto. So, we're going to approach this episode uh, a lot like our CEO series because we obviously have a CEO in the room. So, we're going to understand a bit about uh, Bamboo from Blake's point of view and then, as we said, uh, dive into the the world or ecosystem of crypto. So, Blake, are you able to describe uh, Bamboo in your own words? Yes. Bamboo is a micro savings platform that allows anybody to easily get access to digital assets. Now, the crypto sphere has notoriously been difficult to enter and exit. And we provide a very simple and safe on-ramp for people to get exposure to this exciting asset class. And... Buying digital assets can often be confusing and complicated, and we really try to take that out of the equation, you know, so people don't have to think too much about, oh, what do I do with you know, the private keys, you know, am I buying at the right time? And um, we take a lot of these questions out and uh, give people a safe environment to, to have exposure. Nice. So um, <clears throat> we'll, talk, we'll talk more about Bamboo throughout this uh, interview, but let's start with you. Um, I guess, what's your background? Like, how did you, how did you come to be involved in crypto? Yeah, good question. So my background's in something completely unrelated. I studied uh, urban planning and I studied sustainability in Sweden. Then when I returned to Australia, I realized that sustainable urban planning wasn't really a thing here in Australia <laughs> <laughs> and couldn't find a job that I wanted to take. Um, but I was lucky enough to get a research role in China. I'm working with a Chinese urban design firm. I'm helping them do sustainable urban planning. And when I was in China in 2016 working there, I saw that uh, Bitcoin um, was getting a lot of attention there and that, that there was an opportunity to purchase Bitcoins in Europe and in America and then sell them in China. And 
I didn't know this at the time, but this was called um, arbitrage trading. And I was doing triangulation arbitrage trading and moving cash out through um, Chinese crypto exchanges, um, through the banks uh, and, and doing the trade again. There was about a 10% premium on some days. And the key reason for this is that Chinese people were using crypto to move money outside the country um, and because of the capital controls in China. So that was my introduction to, to crypto and, and trading. And I learned a lot through that process. Uh, I was then ca came back to Australia and was at a Bitcoin meetup one day and, and met some guys, some ex hedge fund guys, and they were starting a crypto investment fund. And they, um, I told them the type of trading I was doing. They were pretty interested. And one of the guys said, you start Monday. And, <laughs> <laughs> and I thought he was joking. You know, I thought he was just a nice guy, had a beer with him, no problems. And I ran in, I didn't end up going in Monday. I thought it was a joke. <laughs> and then about three months later, I ran into these guys and um, they're like, oh, you never rocked up for work. <laughs> so I ended up going in, doing some work with them. They started one of Australia's first crypto investment funds, um, fully licensed with an AFSL. And that was really interesting learning about all the cl compliance that they had to build into what they were doing, um, researching new assets to invest into. And, and startups um, as well. We were investing in, in many early stage crypto and blockchain based startups. Um, this was in 2018 and Bamboo was one of those projects. So not only did the fund invest into Bamboo, um, we all personally invested into Bamboo thinking it was such a great idea. Um, the team, um, the founding team built an amazing product. Um, I consulted to them for some time and worked with the business. I then went off and, and did my own startup for an, for 18 months after that um, and in the process of, of selling that now. And there was an opportunity to, to purchase a Bamboo um, back off the founding team. So the seed investors came in um, and got together and um, pulled some cash together and um, bought the company, recapitalized it. And that was about seven months ago. Um, so since then, you know, we've reestablished the teams um, and started uh, growing the company from there. It's pretty, uh, pretty interesting story uh, yeah. to how you have become CEO of Bamboo. <laughs> A lot going on there. Um, you know, crypto within the Equity Mates community is, I guess, pretty divisive. Um, you know, I think stats show that I think 75% of our audience don't invest in crypto. So we have a lot of work to do uh, to educate the Equity Mates audience as to what crypto is. Mm. Um, why, from your point of view, invest in a crypto business and more generally, why why crypto? What's the, what's the bull case from your point of view? Yeah, really good question. So <laughs> what we're seeing with cryptocurrency and blockchain technology is a lot of innovation. Um, it's creating possibilities for new business models that weren't previously possible. And because of the excitement around this technology, it's attracting a lot of talent, a lot of talent that you could uh, potentially want to back. There's a lot of innovation happening in the space, right? So I think this is one of the key reasons why we should invest um, because it's disrupt uh, disrupting existing business models. So things like remittance, things like banking, things like brokerage, uh, things like settlements. Um, you know, previously we needed all these um, these services um, to sit in the middle of, of things that we do to act as trust anchors. Now that we have blockchain technology and it can be used as a mechanism of trust, um, w you know, we're seeing things that, that previously weren't possible. So it is exciting. Yeah, nice. Yeah. <clears throat> so uh, there's a lot going on at the moment. It feels like every day there's uh, there's more stories about you know crypto, Bitcoin hitting all time highs, Elon Musk selling a non fungible a song about non fungible tokens as a non fungible token. Um, there's a lot of noise. What I guess how do you how do you think about what's going on in the ecosystem at the moment? And I guess what what do you think are the important trends? And then like what do you sort of ignore as just the noise? Yeah, really interesting. So I think when there are new opportunities for new products and services, they receive a lot of hype. You know, I think the market overextends um, and then they scale back and there are a few winners out of out of the hype cycle. You know, what we're seeing with um, NFTs, which are uh, basically uh, digital representations of real world things um, that can't be copied on the internet and people can trade these. So the NBA um, just released some NFT um, uh, NBA cards and 
I think they sold about $250 million worth of these things. And, you know, this represents a new business model for them that previously didn't exist. And yeah, there's a lot of hype around it. But, you know, at the end of the day, I think technologies like this are, are here to stay, you know. Um, we're seeing other trends as well, like companies that are starting to look like um, modern day investment banks and banks. Coinbase is an example of this. So Coinbase is a cryptocurrency exchange that's been around for um, since about 2012, 2013, and led by Brian Armstrong. And they're about to undergo a $100 billion um, IPO, which is um, pretty ridiculous. Um, but, you know, then these guys are, are starting to knock on the door of HSBC, um, UBS, uh, and, and um, Goldman Sachs uh, valuation-wise. Right, uh, and um, I think... The reason for that is because they're accessible to anyone globally. You know, the market is so big um, and their growth trajectory is so strong that um, we're seeing, um, you, know, uh, uh, you know, something that hadn't hasn't happened before in this in, in the banking system, or at least for a hundred years. So it's really fascinating, and we're going to see more and more um, groups like this. Mm. So I think that there's a lot to unpack there, um, but before we do, I think we should take a step back. Um, We've obviously been doing Crypto Week on, uh, we did an Equity Mates episode on Monday. We did a Get Started Investing episode on Tuesday. So hopefully people have listened to those. But if they haven't, um, maybe we should just establish some uh, some basic terminology and stuff because I think that's going to become important as we talk about these trends and what's going on at Coinbase and all of that. So let's start at the very beginning. Uh, what's the difference between uh, blockchain and cryptocurrencies? Blockchain is the underlying technology in the ecosystem, right? And it allows us to transfer value. Now, cryptocurrencies are built on top of, of this or a representation of blockchain. Um, you can create digital tokens on top of blockchains to allow people to exchange value. And these can be termed cryptocurrencies um, if they're used in that sense. So when people hear tokens, I'm just thinking, you know, there's a lot of... Uh uh, jargon when it comes to the crypto crypto land. If people are hearing the word token, can that just be uh, applied just as the same as a, a cryptocurrency? Yeah, it can be. So crypto cryptocurrencies are often tokens in themselves, but I think cryptocurrency describes how the token is being used as currency. Now, tokens don't have to be used as currency. They can be used as other things. Um, so uh, yeah, in some sense, cryptocurrency is a token but i think it comes down to the use case um another example of this is a, a non-fungible token or a, a token that you can exchange um that uh is unique right and uh this can be used for something else for example um you could stamp um your today's headline of the newspaper inside of it and um give that a unique number and then that would be a unique token that you could use for uh, any particular purpose so when people are uh, buying through like Bitcoin or Ethereum through Bamboo or many of the other digital uh, currencies through other platforms, generally speaking, are, are they buying it for to trade in and out of or are there actual use cases for these tokens? Yeah, really good question. So there's a lot of traders, there's a lot of speculators in the space. I think when I first started using Bitcoin, I used it for utility. So when I was living in Sweden, I wanted to transfer money home to Australia and transfer money to a friend in Portugal. And I found that using money transmitters was clunky and expensive. Um, so I used Bitcoin. Mm. And there's a lot of people using it for remittance, particularly um, in uh, you know, uh, third world countries um, who you know, may be using TransferWise or, or PayPal. It's too expensive. So there are um, a lot of different people using it for all sorts of different things. Really, I think it depends on where they live. Um, here in Australia, I think a lot of people are using it as a, a long-term investment. Um, but we also get that portion of investors that are, that are just speculating and trading. Mm. Yeah. I think one more question <coughs> around establishing the basics. And I think pretty relevant given uh, Bamboo has both Bitcoin and Ethereum on its platform. Um there's what? How I don't know how many cryptocurrencies there are thousands now. I'm gonna and thousands. yeah, thousands and thousands. Um, I guess the big two are probably Bitcoin and Ethereum. Um, but for people who are unfamiliar with the crypto world, like I guess first question is why are there so many coins? And then mm. maybe what's the difference between the big two? Mm. Yeah. yeah, good question. So yeah, maybe I answer the latter. So. 
Bitcoin functions as a store of value or something analogous to a digital gold. It has many similar qualities to gold. People park their money there. They don't really move it around because it's a bit expensive and the storage cost is, um, uh, the storage is a bit arduous when you want it to be really safe. Whereas Ethereum isn't just a store of value. It allows people to actually execute code or programs on top of the Ethereum blockchain. Now, it is in its infancy. However, what we're going to see over the next, you know, already we're seeing it, but over the next decade in more prominence, is that our most important computer programs are going to be built on top of this technology, right? So Ethereum allows us to build things like voting protocols, you know? So instead of trusting um, you know, a third party to count the votes, um, the votes can um, be hashed or, or recorded on the blockchain and no one can um, can alter this or, or edit it. We're going to see things like remittance and property settlement. So Ethereum is really interesting because it allows us to not only exchange value but also run code on top of the blockchain. Now this allows us to do interesting things that have never before been possible and an example of this is building um, an application for voting. Um, for in, in politics. Uh, and this allows us to not have to trust any third party for counting the votes. The, the votes are permanently um, locked into the blockchain uh, and no one can alter this, right? And what we're going to see over the next decade is our most important software um, be built on this technology. Another example of this would be remittance or property settlements or um, large financial transactions. Uh, so we, it's been referred to as programmable money. So you can write in how you want the money to interact and, uh, and maybe another example of how this could um, express itself is that if I'm transferring, um, you know, my colleague, uh, 50 bucks and they need to, um, you know, pay a portion of that for their parking fees. Uh, you could potentially program that in um, and it automatically distribute it to the, to the parking lot. So um, similarly for taxes, um, if I needed to transfer you guys some cash and a certain amount of that need to go to taxes, um, then that could automatically be credited and the tax laws coded into that transaction. So Do you this, need to be a coder to understand any of this? <laughs> <laughs> well, at the moment, yeah, you would be, but uh, you know, the user experience will improve over the next you know, decade. Yeah, I mean, in theory, the, the development path should follow like the internet where it's like early days of the internet, you had to be a computer scientist or an engineer to really understand like what you were building. And now we have Squarespace and WordPress where it's drag and drop and everything's mm. you know pretty straightforward. Yeah, that's really interesting that you bring that point up because I think blockchain technology, we have about 1% of the global population that owns crypto. Um, and the internet, uh, when 1% of the global population was using the internet, this was about 1997. Um, so, yeah, we're still very early. Um, and generally, technology like this takes 20 years to fully develop. Yeah, right. So, 1997 led to the 2000 tech boom. Yeah. So, <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah, heading for another one. Yeah, potentially. <laughs> <laughs> but then companies like Amazon then, and yeah, Microsoft yeah, and all yeah. of that came out of it. I mean, is that is that the trend? Like... Um, you, you were talking about Coinbase before, which is a, a crypto broker. So for people who are unfamiliar, unfamiliar, I guess, think of like a Comsec or a, a stake, but for crypto. Mm. Um, but is, is the trend that we're seeing, like are there companies that are positioning themselves as like, you know, the Google of blockchain and the Amazon of blockchain? Like, do we expect to see big companies emerge out of this or will it just be big cryptocurrencies? Yeah, 100%. We're seeing um, incredible growth from some companies. Um, Coinbase is one of those and they're, you know, reaching $100 billion valuations. We're also seeing other groups such as Celsius and BlockFi, which are starting to look like um, crypto banks or modern, uh, you know, the next evolution of banking. They're providing, you know, remittance services, loans, um, yields on people's crypto and uh, Celsius's motto is unbank yourself, right? And these guys are seeing incredible growth. Um, you know, they've uh, 25x their valuation in the last year um, and getting uh, 
a massive adoption and there's lots of opportunity for organizations like this because they're not bound by you know states or countries you know they're, they're global so let's talk about uh the finance space because you know i'm hearing DeFi a lot um decentralized finance but when we were talking uh recently you were also telling me about CFI, which I guess is centralized finance. Is mm. that right? Yeah, exactly yeah. right. So, so yeah, maybe can you just tell us what's going on in the financial landscape and how a lay person like me uh, should understand the changes? Yeah, for sure. So centralized finance is very much like the Celsius, BlockFi and um, Coinbase. There's, they're businesses, centralized businesses that are built, that are used, using blockchain technology to create value and building business models around that. Now, decentralized finance is when it's exactly the same services, but you're not interacting with the business. You're just interacting with code that's um, built on top of blockchains. Um, so they're fully decentralized. They're not regulated. And anyone can do things like get loans, um, get a yield, um, or do uh, remittance through them. So it's really interesting. Um, we, you know, we think that um, they're going to scale um Comparably, um, but there uh, is a lot of debate in the ecosystem, you know, of what people should be using. The purists think you should be moving towards decentralized finance um, because it, it aligns more with the ideology. Um, but, you know, we are seeing massive growth as well from these centralized finance. Again, not to just harp on about the internet uh, analogy, but like early days of the internet, it was the same thing. There were like, you know, internet purists who were talking about how it's like completely free, completely unregulated. Uh, but then as it grows and, you know, the mm. big companies come in and it gets regulated and it feels like there's big, the crypto purists, but more and more, as more and more money moves into the space, that tr change will happen mm. as well. Yeah, I certainly think there's a balance there. And we've seen the prevalence of, you know, the open source movement. And, you know, we see big companies like IBM and, and Google, um, using a lot of open sourced um, software. Um, but, you know, there's also, there's a lot of centralization there as well. Um, they're hoarding data and the like. So I think these things move in tandem as the ecosystem matures. So there's a lot around the decentralization of the finance industry, but what other industries do you kind of see being disrupted by this sort of blockchain technology over the next 20 years or so? Are there any that are, are ripe for disruption mm. are we going to see the downfall of google or amazon for example <laughs> <laughs> yeah i think it's you know google and amazon i don't think are going anywhere <laughs> <laughs> but um you know people that generally acted as intermediaries or um as uh, someone that we could trust in a in a financial transaction um i think uh, their role is going to change um people like banks um people like remittance services um, brokers, um, even accountants and lawyers, because you know, a lot of what they did can now be replaced by these protocols. Um, and I think th these roles are going to take on more uh, adv advisory roles um, if the hard lifting can be done by code. What about fund managers? Ooh, I think fund managers need, uh, there's a certain amount of expertise there. <laughs> and <laughs> I think uh, it'd be pretty hard to replace what they do with code. But yeah. They're... Hey, what can happen in 20 years? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, between AI and blockchain, some of those professional services uh, companies should be getting very worried. You know, like there's all this talk about lawyers being disrupted by AI because they can like search precedents and all that stuff really quickly. And then at the same time, if, you know, you can execute like smart contracts on the blockchain and stuff like that, it's like they're just getting attacked from all sides. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So in terms of other trends that we're seeing, a couple to touch on and let's perhaps walk through them is the, uh, I guess, the adoption of Bitcoin on the balance sheets of some of the, the big companies over in America. Mm. Um, what are you sort of seeing there, the likes of Tesla and, and co? Yeah, this is really interesting. So because of the quantitative easing and all the stimulus checks that have happened in the US over the last 12 months, I think it was 23% of all US dollars were printed in the last 12 months. Um, many of these large companies with la big treasuries sitting in cash are starting to think, you know, take a take a um, real hard look at you know, what these actions by the government, um, how that affects their treasury. 
you know, is their um, treasury worth 23% less after these actions? And um, that's saying that they have to consider. So they're looking at options to hedge out of currency. And some of these companies have um, come to look at Bitcoin, uh, which is a deflationary asset um, and n no more coins can be printed. So they're using this as a hedging mechanism. So a couple of um, prominent people such as Elon Musk and Michael Slayer um, have um, put quite a lot of money in over a billion dollars each. And they're encouraging other companies to do the same thing. Michael Slayer, particularly, he held a conference with, I think, a thousand other CEOs in the US, um, giving them uh, basically the game plan of how to do it, how to how to manage the custody, how to change internal policies, you know, so all these other groups can move into the space. Now, what potentially could happen here is that we see, you know, you know, dozens or, or hundreds of, you know, the largest companies in, in the States move in this direction as a hedge against quantitative easing. Mm. Well, uh, Equity Mates has, uh, I think we did it before Elon. So yeah. Elon followed us, but uh, Equity Mates has a bit of crypto on the balance sheet. Yeah, uh, fantastic. So we'll be hedging against the deflation as well. <laughs> <laughs> we should also hold a conference to tell people yeah. in, in, the, in the podcast space. It was actually done. super easy. We just contacted someone and asked if they could set up a business account. <laughs> they did and we bought some. That's funny. Yeah. We just need to. I mean, it's not surprising that, um, you know, they are holding conferences and Elon's tw uh, tweeting to his 46 million followers followers to buy bitcoin because inevitably everyone's going to pile in his fortune's going to skyrocket so mm, yeah, yeah for sure. not surprised mm. so you touched on the inflation hedge uh there and i think you know a lot of uh people you know a lot of people who've listened to our show for a while would have heard us talk about it um you know mainly in terms of what it has meant for the equity markets and you know you can sort of draw a very strong correlation between the amount of money printing and a lot of that money flowing into the stock market mm. since COVID hit. Mm. Um, but, you know, Bitcoin, people often talk about Bitcoin as the hedge against inflation. Um, there are other hedges, gold being one of them. And, you know, Bamboo as a platform offers uh, both uh, crypto in Bitcoin and Ethereum and then precious metals in gold and silver. Mm. So you're really covering your bases in terms of uh, hedging against inflation. Yeah. Um, I guess, how do you think about the difference or the choice between Bitcoin and gold? Mm. They're very similar in their qualities. Um, traditionally, gold has been um, used as a hedge um, and similarly silver. Um, but gold and silver, there's costs associated with the storage. So you know, I don't know if you guys have bought any gold or silver lately, but when Bryce has a few necklaces that he uh, keeps. Yeah. <laughs> in case I go to jail. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay, but um, yeah, so there's a lot of costs associated with storing them. There's generally you, you lose a few percent as soon as you buy it. You know, this it's okay if that's a, a long term um, long term investment, but it is clunky um, and no one walks around with gold uh, with them. Now, Bitcoin um, similarly is a deflationary asset, but it's um, far more portable um, and it has um, you know, potentially more utility if um, people can use it for day-to-day for -day purposes. Uh, and gold has traditionally seen, been seen as a hedge and many countries all around the world have gold as part of their treasury. But what we may see over the next decade is that Bitcoin also forms part of government uh, treasuries and it's going to be really interesting if this happens so for example if germany or the us or you know brazil comes in and say hey you know we need to have half a percent of this thing um you know and a lot of other countries um, will follow suit if that sort of thing starts happening yeah there's there's been some articles and stuff about like central banks creating digital currencies um I guess my question is going to be very general. Like, what's the go with that? <laughs> is yeah. that something that would happen? Is that would you count that as a as a cryptocurrency if they did? Mm. They are certainly using blockchain technology. The the groups, uh, the countries that are planning on doing this, but it's going to be not decentralized. It's going mm. to be very very centralized. Mm. The first country, the the most prominent country that's looking at this is China mm -hmm. with the Chinese yen and. Groups like Alibaba, um, uh, you know, uh, encouraging this sort of innovation. 
uh, and we are seeing like the Euro investigator and, and other countries. Now, what this allows them to do once it's fully um, you know, used and distributed amongst the, uh, you know, f for, for commerce is that they can, instead of, they, they know where all the money is at one time. You know, they can audit the whole currency with a, with a piece of code and find out you know, how much have you spent, how much taxes have you paid. No longer uh, would they need auditors for companies or individuals. Um, it, it could be a piece of code and it, it creates extreme efficiencies. So I have no doubt that you know, over the next decade we'll see many other large um, nation states moving in this direction and potentially one day um, as we move towards a cashless society um, every, every country will be using this technology. It's also a political play because if, if the central bank are taking ownership of paying people direct then the government aren't the ones having it on their balance sheet. What? As in, <laughs> I don't understand that. Well, because the government aren't coming out and putting a billion dollars in debt on their balance sheet because the Reserve Bank themselves are the ones that are um, pushing out the crypto direct into bank account. No, the government would still have to raise debt, wouldn't they? No, the, that's one of the arguments is that uh, it can all be sitting within the, the central bank and they can just directly transact with you with their crypto if, if fiat is still in play. And the government don't have to be the ones to take on debt and also pay you. Is that so, right? Yeah. I'm not sure. I haven't heard that, but it's possible. <coughs> it feels like that. It, no, isn't it? They're just going to try and digitize the currency. I but, mean, like the money system will still work the same way. Like the central bank will issue, but like no, I mean to the point where they could have still fiat, and the government st still takes that sort of side of things, and then the central bank can also have their digital currency transacting as well. Right. Well, I'm going to... Let's not get bogged down in this, but I'm going to challenge <laughs> yeah, you to you. put something in the show notes. I'll, sp I'll put a YouTube link. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, a lot's happening in crypto at the moment. A lot's happened um, really since Bitcoin was started in 2011. If you think sort of five years, maybe 10 years into the future, what do you think's going to... What do you expect to happen over the next five or 10 years? Yeah. Uh, so first up, we're going to see more government coins. Um, that's that's low-hanging fruit. And uh, we're also going to see more blockchain-based clearing systems. So uh, the ASX, for example, is moving um, away from their chess clearing system to a blockchain-based clearing system. And um, they, uh, many other exchanges around the world for equities will move in this direction. We also believe that you know, currently there's there's twenty percent of Australians that own cryptocurrency, and over the next five years, that's going to move to to fifty percent or beyond, and um, form part of uh, many people's um, portfolio in the same way that equities do. We're going to see more large investment funds, endowment funds, and governments move into the space, um, and I think this is a self fulfilling. Um, prophecy as soon as a couple do it then another doesn't do it and then before you know it there's hundreds and thousands um, so that's certainly going to happen over the next um, five years um, and in regard to price um, you know uh, it's really hard to say where it's going um, but if these large institutions um, do start coming into the space uh, it is going to be um, very interesting as they move billions of dollars into a finite supply yeah well it's just a supply and demand play really yeah I don't have anything more to say than that. <laughs> <laughs> exactly right. <laughs> so, can I guess a yes or no answer is, can governments ban Bitcoin? Uh, they could ban Bitcoin in the same way that they could ban the internet. So, you know, I think what would we would see um, to be a more likely scenario is um, it being um, regulated and restricted in some ways. And uh, even in China where... Um, the internet is regulated and restricted. People still use VPNs to have access to the to the full internet. So, I think um, you know that's kind of the worst case scenario. Mm. Mm. It wasn't quite a yes or no answer that Bryce tried to pigeonhole <laughs> you into, but I think it, I think it was a good answer. It's it's really like as long as there are people mining it and the and the blockchain is there, it can never be fully banned. I don't think it can be banned. You know, people always find ways to use it, um, and uh, as I think, you know, if one country um, bans it, they're stunting innovation and they're locking themselves out of, um, you know, um, lots of commerce and business. Hmm. Um, so they'll be doing it at their own peril, in my opinion. Hmm. 
So there's one other component I quickly want to touch on, and that is the cold storage element. And this probably ties into bamboo um, because I want to understand what it means if you are dollar cost averaging and building portfolios in these platforms. Um, So firstly, do you want to address what sort of cold storage is or Mm. how you can securely store Bitcoin and then how that feeds into something like bamboo and if it's if it's possible um, and how yeah you can securely and safely start investing in Bitcoin. Mm. Yeah, so cold storage is a way of storing your digital assets offline so they can't be hacked. Now, this is generally thought of best practice, um, but there are new technologies that provide things like warm storage that are um, just as secure but can still be online in some capacities. Okay. Now, at Bamboo, we have insured custody wallets um, that hold our Bitcoin and they are online, um, but um, they're extremely safe um, and uh, they use military grade technology to secure um, the wallets. Um, so Blake actually has a AK-47 behind him. <laughs> Always got military grade technology around. Yeah, him. that's our security. <laughs> <laughs> so wait, you said they're insured. Um, so that means if my Bitcoin gets hacked on Bamboo, I get paid that back from the insurance company? Yeah, that's uh, exactly right. So the way that it works is that if the insured solution um, gets hacked or if there's some sort of fraud, um, then um, the insurance company would investigate and then compensate if there uh, is a legitimate claim there. Um, but uh, the crypto can't be hacked off your mobile phone. It's completely separate. Um, and yeah, the mobile the mobile app is more of an interface to allow you to buy and sell and manage your, your portfolio. Yeah, nice. So that kind of ties in nicely to, to I guess, the end of this conversation um, around uh, what Bamboo can sort of offer um, in terms of investment strategies, you know, Alec and I often speak about the value of uh, consistently just putting money into the market over a long period of time, taking the emotion out of it. And I think that's what is certainly appealing to to us when it comes to bamboo, because you can uh, micro invest into bamboo. And then when that rounds up to, what is it, 50 bucks? Mm, $50, yeah. 50 bucks, you'll then take it out of the account and uh, divvy that between whatever the portfolio setup is is between mm. Bitcoin, Ethereum, gold, and silver. And obviously, you don't have to use this platform for Bitcoin or Ethereum if you want to stick to the tra- traditional methods of, uh, I guess, he- hedging inflation or whatever you might want to use gold for or silver, then you can also use the app for, for that. So um, I think when it comes to an incredibly volatile asset like cryptocurrency, Bitcoin, and Ethereum, um, dripping into and taking the emotion out of uh, these sorts of assets is a, is a good way to, I guess, build a portfolio without having to time the market because good luck trying to time a 40%, 40% <laughs> drop and then a 20% recovery in 60 seconds. Mm, like, mm. Um, exactly. Yeah. yeah, exactly right. So not even the professionals can time it all the time. You know, it's very difficult and it's a, a very volatile market. So we've designed the app to... Um, help people um, be uh, as successful as possible by dollar cost averaging, buying small amounts every week or month um, so that they can get an average price into the marketplace. And I think this is really cool because when the price is down, you're buying more of the asset. When the price is up, you're buying less of the asset. So we've had some people do really well. They um, have been dollar cost averaging over the last two years and you know have gone you know, increased their portfolio by you know five six seven hundred percent so the strategy works um and uh it's really great to see those success stories and then uh i guess when i am putting my money into bamboo are you then uh you know you take the it rounds up it gets to 50 you take it are you then buying those assets or are you just buying like derivative products or you know yeah um, no, we, we certainly buy those those products. Um, we API into um, a, a cryptocurrency exchange and execute those trades um, instantaneously um, as well as your sell orders um, and then you know deposit the money into your bank account. And then let's say I build my million dollar crypto portfolio on Bamboo um, yeah. <laughs> and then I want to take it into cold storage or take it off the platform or whatever. Like uh, what are the rules around that? Like how do I do that? Yeah, that's a good question. So we don't allow people to move crypto off the platform. You know, this is generally done on cryptocurrency exchanges and we're not a crypto exchange. 
we're a savings app and we package something up that um, allows people to dollar cost average, micro save and, you know, hedge out um, of, you know, hedge against uh, currency inflation um, in a very simple and easy way. And we try to remove the complexity. Now, once you start interacting with cold storage wallets, mm. um, sending um, crypto around um, to, uh, to other people in other locations, there's a lot of opportunity of messing it up. And there's a, a bit of a learning curve there because if you send crypto to the wrong address, you lose it. You know, you can't call the bank or Visa and, and get the, the transaction reversed. So we try to make investment effortless um, and uh, you know, people can certainly go off and do that on other platforms, but, but not with ours. Yeah, I think that's the main thing about Bamboo. It's just... <clears throat> It's easy. It's the easiest one we've found, mm. just mm. in terms of like set and forget dollar cost average. Yeah. So for those uh, who want to get started on their crypto journey with Bamboo, uh, you can head across, download the app and sign up. Use Equity Mates as the code and uh, they'll throw 10 bucks your way to start in whatever your portfolio um, setup is. So uh, Equity Mates, that's the code. Don't forget it. I would be very surprised if anyone did $10 just in silver. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> boring. Yeah. <laughs> well, Blake, it's been an absolute pleasure chatting with you. Um, you know, you've got a pretty interesting background and all the best with Bamboo over the next few years. We're certainly going to be following this one pretty closely. Um, Equity Mates, as I said, is all about making markets accessible and there's, uh, you know, many, many sort of offers like this coming to the market and uh, we're pretty selective in the ones that we talk about because... Um, I guess, you know, can't talk about them all, no, but it's no. also there's important. A, there's a certain uh, other podcast that we won't <laughs> name that has gone all in on crypto and we don't want to do that, but no. we are, we're are crypto curious, as we like <laughs> to say, and um, we think we think you, what you're building is, is pretty interesting. Yeah. Fantastic. So, thanks so much for having me, guys. Great to be in here and hopefully we can speak again. That's wonderful. I will say this about investing. Everything you do learn is cumulative. What I learned at 20 is useful.